Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Business Growth Show, where we talk about all components of business and how to utilize them for exponential growth. My name is Ethan Cassiotis. I'm a serial entrepreneur, international speaker, results strategist, business coach, mentor, and consultant. Today, I have an awesome guest. He is a consultant, speaker, and principal of Dev Advisors, a digital entertainment consulting firm that provides expertise to service providers, app developers, content owners, and investors. He has more than 40 years of experience in the music and interactive industries and has worked with some of the biggest brands, including Sony, Warner Music, MTV, AT&T, Virgin Mobile, and ABC Television. Welcome, Dick Wingate, and thank you for being on my show. Well, thank you, Ethan. Appreciate your, uh, your offer to come on. It's nice to be here. Yeah, awesome to have you here, Dick, and I'm sure we're going to provide huge amounts of value for everybody watching and listening today. So you're a very successful entrepreneur. So for those people who don't know who you are, please introduce yourself by telling us about you and your journey. Okay, that would be wonderful. I, you know, I started in the music business when I was still in college at Brown University in, in Rhode Island here in the States, and I became a DJ and then the music director and then the program director of the uh, the, the radio station that was actually the number one FM radio station in Rhode Island at the time. So I became uh, relatively important uh, to the record companies who were promoting their artists to try to get airplay and they would bring the artists up to the station regularly and uh, artists like Bruce Springsteen were brought up to the station when their first records came out and and so I, I really I loved radio, but I also had my eye on the recorded music business, and that's kind of where I ended up going after uh, uh, after I got an offer to go work for a, for an independent record label, um, which is uh, doesn't exist now. I call Chess Janus Records, and after spending a year there, uh, breaking an artist named Al Stewart, who had a worldwide hit called Year of the Cat. Uh, I got hired by Columbia Records, uh, which was my dream. I, I, I wanted to work for Columbia Records because that was the label that had Bob Dylan and Bruce Springsteen and Billy Joel and just so many iconic artists. And uh, when I got that call to go over there as a product marketing manager, I was, I was just over the moon. And I was really young. I mean, I was still only about 23. I, I was by far the youngest product manager that Columbia had ever hired and immediately made my mark. And so uh, I, because I, I I related well to these young artists that were coming through. And, and so they I ended up with the Bruce Springsteen account and Elvis Costello and Pink Floyd and, and Peter Tosh after he made, when he made his first two solo albums after leaving Bob Marley and the Wailers. And, uh, you know, I was very much involved with these artists and, and uh, the experience of work with these artists who are, who are seminal artists of the 20th century. I got to work with all at the same time and it was really fantastic. Uh, I wrote the marketing plans for some of their biggest releases. Following that, I, I had an eye towards going to the, the A&R and production side of the business, meaning signing and developing talent finding producers and songs where appropriate for the talent. And so I moved over to uh, the Epic division of, of what was then CBS Records. Now it's called Sony Music. Um, and uh, for the next seven years, I, I signed and recorded a, a, a number of artists and had some pretty big hits. Uh, for those that remember uh, Electric Avenue by Eddie Grant, uh, which was a, a top 10 records in the States and uh, others like Amy Mann and, and I had a chance to work with artists like Stevie Ray Vaughan and others. And, and then from there, I was um, hired to be the head of A&R as this, that's what the creative division of a, a department of any record company is called, A&R standing for artists and repertoire. I was uh, hired to be the head of A&R at another one of the major labels, doesn't exist anymore. Polygram Records was one of the big six labels that were then now it through consolidation there's only three now but and polygram was bought by universal in, in the uh, uh 
uh, I guess it was early to mid nineties. And I became the head of a and there and, and uh, was overseeing hundreds of artists at the same time. And that was an extraordinary experience. I, I went from working with just a handful of artists to working with the entire roster of artists. And, and we had a great run that ended around the end of the eighties. And it was at that point, a seminal moment occurred in, the, in, in my career. Uh, I, I, for, so for 10 years, I'd, I'd been looking for artists, you know, and, and that, back then that meant listening to a lot of bad cassette tapes and going out to a lot of hot clubs that were, you know, filled with cigarette smoke and, you know, the bands would go on an hour after they're supposed to go on. And it, I was kind of burned out on it and I wasn't sure if I wanted to do that anymore. And I got turned on to a piece of technology and I was not technology centric at all up to this point. And it was an interactive music preview system that this gentleman had developed out in the San Francisco area that was incredibly sophisticated, allowed you to listen to music in the record store before you bought it, which sounds so mundane. Today, we, we, we would never purchase music unless you listen to it. But then that the only music you could listen to when you were in a record store was what was on the in-store system where they sometimes had a few CD players that had some very few CDs that had been selected that you could throw the headphones on. And this system, which I, licensed all the music for and programmed all the music for allowed you to listen to anything by scanning the barcode on the physical product or looking it up uh, uh, through a, a touchscreen and uh, that's what sudden I was in I got just the, the concept of of technology to raise the bar for the music industry really excited me and so I went on a journey that started then, which really is the beginning of the sort of um, the path that I'm, I'm, I'm still, you know, on, which is to continue, I've continued to look for technology and entrepreneurs and um, software or hardware that expands the music industry and brings, brings uh, music to more people. So if you if you think about it, I started as a DJ where I was turning people onto new music. And then I was a marketing guy where I was writing marketing plans to turn people on to Elvis Costello and others and, and to get it in front of people. And then I was making records with new artists to try to get it talent out to the world. And then it, it sort of changed to like, well, wow, maybe I'm really, now I'm interested in like technology that can help raise the profile for, for music. And entrepreneurs became the new lead singers, if you know what I mean, right? I would look at uh, a company or an entrepreneur that say, oh, well, th this is like the lead singer of a band, you know, it, it can, uh, is this, are they good enough to, to, to bring this home or as, Clive Davis, who I also worked for, there was a two year period that I actually went back into the mainstream business uh, as the head of marketing yet again with Arista Records and working for the renowned music mogul and, and uh, uh, you know, Hall of Fame music uh, executive Clive Davis. But he used to say, when he would evaluate a, a band, he would say, is the lead saying, can I see this? Can I really visualize this artist playing Madison Square Garden, are they that good, right? Well, I saw similarly with, with tech, I had to make some decisions on who I got involved with based on the, the you know, management team and the, the product and the tech team. And it was like evaluating a band. And so that, and there you go there. The, the, and that's still the path I'm on. I love working with uh, early stage companies. And so the first one I really got involved with in the late nineties was a company called Liquid Audio and uh, first as an advisor and then as the chief content officer. And, and they were the leader in digital music distribution prior to Apple uh, ever launching iTunes. 
Um, and I did all the licenses with all the major record companies and independent record companies. And we had 60 music retailers selling downloads, including, you know, some of the biggest of the time, Tower Records and barnesandnoble.com and bestbuy.com and others. And, and that was the quite a ride because I was trying to convince the music industry, every label, I would go in and try to convince them that their future was in on the internet. And it was uh, three or four years of to get everybody on board, at Universal being the last one. And then iTunes launched, which, you know, took it to another whole level. Uh, following that, I, again, I always like to look over the hill, like, what's next? And as soon as that got out of the gate, as soon as like, okay, now music is being sold uh, online in a, in a uh, commercial uh, protected way, not, you know, not through file sharing, uh, where the artists and labels got compensated. I said, what I knew instinctively the next thing was going to be the, the cell phone, that the next platform was going, that was going to have, be meaningful for exposing music was the cell phone. And it was still the age of, there were no smartphones yet. It was the age of flip phones. There might have, there, there were early Blackberries out there and trios and, you know, they, they certainly weren't designed to stream any media. And so that was the next hurdle uh, over the next few years from like 2005 through eight or nine, I was evangelizing and uh, on behalf of the company that I ended up uh, being chief content officer for Nelly Moser, which was funded by SoftBank. And we built the first mobile streaming apps for MTV and for ABC television and for uh, Warner Music and uh, one of Sony's divisions and, and others. And it was, um, again, very, very early days, but I, I had this instinct about where things were going. And again, Apple came in and, you know, they took over the market. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's uh, to have the, the marketing heft and the ability to, the reach that Apple had, you know, put everyone else to shame. So um, these companies that I worked with were sold and they were sold for, 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 for decent money, but the um, Apple changed the game both times. So, and that brings us up through the 2010s. And I've, and since then I've been working with software developers, app developers, content owners, um, and um, music services on doing business development for them and licensing, artist relations, label relations, uh, helping with fundraising, helping with product ideation. I kind of wear a lot of hats because I've worn a lot of hats over the last 40 plus years. And I, and to, and I love working with young talent and young entrepreneurs. And so that gives me, it, it just, I, I just enjoy the, the building of, of new companies. So that's my long and winding road. And that is, you know, has led to my company Dev Advisors, which I've been running now since uh, about 2012, I guess. Yeah. What an amazing story there, Dick. Um, so many amazing things. And, you know, what I take from that is how innovative your thinking is. You saw things before they were happening, go, this is the way forward. And you were the, you know, the instigator, so to speak, in the industry, which is amazing, right? And yes, sometimes <clears throat> the second um, people come through, like the Apple, if they've got the budget and everything like that, they can overtake. But like you said, if, if you can sell the businesses and things, um, then it's all worth it um, in the end along the way as well. So uh, that's really awesome. And it's, it's very interesting how um, you know, and obviously working with a lot of those big artists and that, you know, would have been very fulfilling. I'm sure, you know, people that you listen to and everything, which is amazing um, from from those days. And then obviously, you know, still working with them today. Um, and you touched on it. I'd like to just add a little bit more. So obviously we're moving online, right? Everything's moving more and more online now. And, and you, you touched on it in your story, I guess. Where do you see the music industry heading, um, you know, to ensure that it continues to grow? Well, it's, it's, it's interesting. We're at another inflection point. So we go through the download era, which history will see as purely as a bridge from 
packaged music to streaming, which is what it was. And we, we, we all knew that streaming would be, ultimately we'd be listening to everything on demand. As, as early as 1996, I did a panel uh, in which uh, we, we talked about the, the celestial jukebox, you know, as a concept, that that was where it would end up, that music would end up being a, a utility, that, you know, you, you pay a monthly rate. And this was in 1996. It, and, and, of course, there were early attempts at streaming subscription services. They were not terribly successful because they weren't, they didn't have everybody's music. The Universal and Sony launched one and BMG and EMI launched one. And it's like, it's not like the movie business where you can have a service, you don't have to have every movie to be successful. Netflix certainly doesn't have every, it doesn't have any new movies that, other than the ones they produce. But even that they didn't do. But in the music business, to have a successful subscription service, you really, you, you had to have the whole thing. And, and Spotify broke that. They, they, they were able to pull that off. But now the, the streaming business is, has started to mature a bit. You still have the growth. You still have growth, but not you know, the kind of hockey stick growth that we had over the last five years. And um, it's, it's, a, it's still not... Uh, the best place for music discovery. A lot of music is discovered, but a lot of, but there's so much music. Do you know how much music is released every single day? How much? 60,000 songs. It's a lot. That's more than used to get released every year back in, you know, pre-internet days. So there's, it's a, um, the, the uh, streaming music services have been a boom to musicians because plus the equipment for recording has become so inexpensive that everyone can have a home studio, can make a record and have it up on Spotify and Apple Music and Amazon and everywhere else in a matter of, in a matter of days. The flip side of that is everybody's doing it, right? So it's a, it's a it's still about discovery and um, playlists on music services became the kind of best way for discovery and the most competitive area the way the labels would compete to get songs on radio and they still do but um, but they really compete much more at the at the early stages of records to get them onto playlists um, that are followed on the music services mm. but that only gets you so far what's happening now is is short form music video like tiktok has just become enormously uh successful in music discovery it's become enormously successful in launching artists purely from a 30 second or 30 or 40 second music sample, so a piece of a song, if it's got the right visual, can blow up an artist. And it's happened with over and over and over again recently. I should say it could blow up a song. You don't always know if there's a real artist there, but it can blow up a song. Uh, and, you know, Old Town Road, which you probably know, uh, was, you know, global hit and the biggest, you know, the biggest single of, of last year in, in this country. Anyway, it was started as a, as a, a little video clip by the artist on, on TikTok. And, and now there's many other examples. So the social media now has become a, um, a, a very important method for the music industry to continue to uh, sell, you know, expose more artists and therefore sell more records because that leads to, there's a direct line from getting more TikTok plays to getting more Spotify plays. The more Spotify plays, the more likely you are to get on com commercial, you know, broadcast radio or to get on a television show. It's just, it, 
it's all you know it's it's kind of a, a sequence now so that's that's right now that's now as far as new revenue streams um that are still really nascent you have augmented reality and virtual reality i i think there's a big opportunity for uh, augmented reality um Apple is uh, expected to release augmented reality glasses in 2022. You know, the first Google ones were an abject failure. Um, but um, it was also, you know, I, I do believe there is a, a great opportunity to create experiences around music through augmented reality. Um, virtual reality, there, there's, there's a number, a, a lot of virtual reality shows that have been made available on various platforms like Melody VR and others. I, I don't know that they're been terribly successful from a revenue perspective. Um, I think that most people don't want to, you know, most people don't really want to put on a, you know, a, a, a helmet uh, or, or a headpiece um, just to listen to music or, you know, gamers do. It's, that's a whole nother world. But that's also another area that's become very important for exposing music. And that's getting music into the gaming environment. And not just the music, but the artists into the gaming environment. And that's, there have been some enormously successful events with artists doing performances in a gaming environment or in a virtual environment. Uh, well, Basically, they're one and the same, and and selling a lot of merch, and and uh, and selling now NFTs uh, is is the the latest sort of bright shiny object that the record industry record industry likes to they like to follow bright shiny objects, you know it's like oh it's NFTs more found money, you know, and. Uh, but the, you know, it remains to be seen, you know, whether that's something that can be done with any consistency. Certain artists uh, have been very successful selling NFTs, but they're not, they're not the mainstream artists. They're they're mostly artists who have been doing um, drops for a long time and have developed a following, and they come out of the EDM or the art art world, um, or they have they're like Snoop, you know, like where he's got fans who will buy buy anything, right? And he'll sell anything, right? We know that Snoop will put his name on anything that's it, that will sell. But uh, for instance, a mainstream band like Kings of Leon, who I don't even know if they're a, a, a name that's recognizable in Australia, but you know they've had some big hits here. They they put out an NFT and um, you know, didn't really didn't really sell well. So in certain cases, I think it, it could be a significant revenue driver. But the question is, who owns the who owns the the and for an artist to do an F, NFT with music? In most in many cases, they don't own the music. The record company owns the music. So there's rights issues and that still need to be resolved, but, and splits that need to be worked out if they're gonna include, say for instance, an unreleased track with a piece of art. Um, the art may have been created by the, the recording artists and therefore, and, and belong to the recording artists, but the track does not. So there's some, there's some things to be worked out, but that's, that's the newest um, platform that the record labels are all you know, looking very strongly at. Yeah, I love that. Thank you for, for doing that. And it's interesting to see how um, it's evolving, as you said, with social media being massive now. And um, then, yeah, looking at these other NFTs and, and other things and, and augmented reality, I agree. I think that, you know, we could, why not have like, an artist playing somewhere and then having 10 concerts or more going at the same time, right. With a lot of people, um, you know, watching them and everything like that. Um, there's, there's a lot of possibilities there um, for, for that. Yes. You want to 
see them live but if you know if it allows us to see them when it would be difficult especially in a world right now where we can't travel and things like that to see artists um, from overseas then um, you know I think I'm all for it so it's gonna be interesting to see yeah yeah well I, I I'm glad you brought that up because I didn't mention just how much development has occurred in this past year because of COVID with live streaming platforms of which there are now dozens of really good ones and they're all com they're, they're competing for the same artists uh, in some in many cases and a lot of artists um, the beginning of COVID you know we were all stuck at home and artists would pick up their guitar and sit in their living room and or maybe play the piano in their living room and we were all kind of like oh this is cool right we could see them in their environment and and then that got boring really fast um, and so you started to move into much more elaborate productions specifically for streaming that, you know, ended up being, you know, seven figure productions by the biggest artists. Right. And they, that was the equivalent of doing a tour. You know, they, they, that, that thing was seen by every one of their artists and, and, um, these streaming solutions are, are live streaming solutions are not going away. They're, they're, they will now be complementary to live events, again, for people who can't get in. Uh, and there may be a combination, you know, live and, and uh, uh, internet based events uh, where certain elements of it are only available online and uh, and there may be geo-restricted live shows where, for instance, an artist could, some artists, they play, they play the same, they play this pretty much the same set every night, right? So it doesn't really matter what's, what city you see them in. But there, there's a lot of artists who change their repertoire significantly from night to night. And that's where it gets really interesting where, you know, people would be streaming shows, multiple shows from uh, just to see what they're gonna play. And, and then you kept the geo, add in the potential for doing different shows in different cities and geofencing. There was an, an early attempt at geofencing was done by Todd Rundgren and the technology kind of failed, but I think they'll figure it out. And which, you know, he does a show uh, for New York and he does a show for LA and he does a show for Sydney. And it's, you know, and where the set list is and, and the conversation from the artist are, you know, relevant to that location. So that's a, that's something I'm, I'm hoping they can work that out because then you kind of have like, oh, this is when he's coming to my town. That's the show I want to see. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, really interesting to see how that's changing um, in that space. And um, it, it's sort of pioneering and, and COVID, I think, has just accelerated, you know, us to pivot, right, on how do we do things differently, um, you know, when you've got that type of mindset and, um, I think that, you know, flows well to, to learn more about you, right? So Dev Advisors, um, you know, you act as the, the bridge between music and, and the technology industries, right? And it's amazing, you know, what you've already said about the innovations you've done in the industry. So, so maybe how do you help people and businesses, um, you know, a bit more specifically in, in that capacity? Yeah, I, I mean, typically uh, I, I work, you know, with the, the founder and the, or, found, you know, the, the, the management team in trying to assess for depending on you know what the what their um, goal is uh, to assess if they if it's something that requires music rights uh, then I have to be the one to explain to them what that that process might be how long it might take what it might cost and what the challenges, you know, are going to be in terms of um, uh, even things as simple as reporting. You know, the, if you want a, a license to use music from 
in a major record company, you have to, you have to, every record company has, they all have separate or different structures for reporting. It sounds mundane, right? But, you know, th th there's a lot of development that has to be. And so I, I'm always trying to explain the, uh, that they're going to have to be patient if it's going to require music rights. If it's more along the lines of, uh, I'm acting as a, uh, I'm acting as an ambassador to, uh, with the company's software or services and introducing it to the record companies to try to get them to use it, not to license any music for it, but to have their artists use it. Uh, and, um, or to, I go directly to the artists and managers to try and, and introduce the technology to them. So there's a company I've been working with for a couple of years called Audible Reality. And Audible Reality launched an app um, last uh, September that allows you to um, listen to music and personalize the sound that's going in your ears the way you would flip filters on Instagram to personalize a photograph. Uh, instead, you're changing the sound to what sounds good to you. Uh, it's it's a real-time 3D audio processor, and it, it literally works as simple as flipping through a carousel. It, it, it'll work with Spotify, for instance, or music on your phone. But the point is that it was my task to find a dozen artists who would take, you know, put their names on this and create custom, they're called vibes. These filters are called vibes to create custom vibes for, for the launch. So that's a, that's a typical uh, or a brief endeavor that, you know, to, to help a company, you know, come to market. Um, I, oftentimes I'm, I'm actually uh, just uh, trying to uh, create partnerships. I do a lot of partnerships. So, you know, trying to find strategic partners for my clients uh, to help them get from, you know, point A to point B, maybe a little faster by, by uh, you know, partnering with uh, another, another company. So um, I really enjoy that. That's probably the work I enjoy the most because it's really strategic. Um, and then, as I said, some, you know, sometimes I'm actually, you know, helping out with investment. I'm not a, I'm not a, a registered broker dealer, so I'm not a banker, but I am often helping with presentations for investors. I, you know, will take the call or the zoom with the, um, you know, with the founder and, uh, um, you know, or, you know, send presentations out to, but I, again, I'm not, I'm not a, uh, sorry about the late afternoon light that's streaming in here. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't represent myself as a, as a, uh, a, a broker for that. Uh, so those are some of the, some of the things that I do. And, and I also, uh, advise uh, a couple of, uh, venture firms, you know, when anything, they get something in the door that's, you know, music or media related, they typically will send it to me for my analysis. So, uh, I like doing that as well, obviously. And I've done some angel investing myself. I don't do a lot of it. Um, it's, uh, I've had, you know, the, some of the things I've done have, have had successful exits, you know, not, not all of them. That's for sure. I mean, that's the, uh, isn't that the, the life of an angel, right? It's not my core business, but I, I play around sometimes. And so, um, and sometimes I'll take stock in companies um, that uh, maybe can't pay my typical, you know, monthly fees. And, you know, that works out sometimes, you know. I had one company that was sold to Google and um, another company that uh, uh, was um, uh, sold to um, a company called Pex. Uh, and, you know, sometimes you get a little lucky and sometimes you don't, you know, but that I, I, I you'd have to, to be an angel investor and be successful, you got to do it full time. And, and it's not something I, you know, I'm, I'm, I have the time to do right now.
Yeah, I love that. Very um, intriguing. Yeah, all the different components there of what you do. And I love the uh, the partners, you know, area that you were talking about, the strategic place, like the joint venture type of relationships where it's like, okay, how do we leverage um, where either we're in the similar markets or different markets and and working together in, in making that happen. So that's, uh, that's really awesome. Um, yeah, a lot, of the, a lot of the companies that I work with, they they need to have partnerships with the music service providers. So, you know, uh, I've got to go to Spotify or to, you know, to Pandora or to Apple or to Amazon or whoever to try to um, open the door for a conversation with my clients. Yeah, beautiful. That's awesome. Um, yeah, the biggest platforms there. And, you know, obviously for you to have those relationships and everything like that is is important, right? Because it's challenging, right? Whatever type of business you're starting, right? It's, it's always challenging at the start. And, and you know, relationships are, are massive, you know, as part of that, right? Um, and, you know, you've built a lot over your, you know, there and for you to be able to connect dots, um, you know, very quickly for people, then that's invaluable. Um, and like you said, um, however, you know, the way you structure that, um, but that's, that's amazing. And, um, you know, that's, that's massive amounts of value for, for everyone wanting to, to make that um, big there. So um, I guess, obviously, there, there's apps and stuff, you know, like you work with that are, that are becoming bigger now, right? Like it's, it's a big app world and, and things like that. So how do you help people monetize them, I guess, because there's a lot of apps that can be created, right? Um, and, and there's different models, whether it's freemium and then you, you pay or not. But um, I guess in, in your space, um, you know, to create something good that's monetizable, h- how does that work? Well, that's a, that's a big question for every, <laughs> for every founder. And, and one of the things that I look for when I accept a a um, engagement with a, a founder is whether I think they have the the ability to understand when they need to pivot and understand when maybe the initial business model isn't isn't working out. And, and I, this goes back to what I was saying about you know evaluating talent on on the on the um, entrepreneurial level, the way I used to evaluate talent on the musical level. It's like, um, also, it's not just the ability to know instinctively how to pivot, but that that I have confidence that they're gonna be able to, to pull it off and that I have confidence that they're gonna listen uh, to my advice because it doesn't, if, if if I'm advising them, I want, I want, you know, and they don't pay any attention to my advice. Well, then, what's the point? And I have worked with a lot of startups, not too, not too many, but enough so that I've learned my lesson. That when you have a, you have a, a founder or founders that are, you know, unable to, they're they're so um, wrapped up in their own. You know their own head and their own vision that they can't they can't accept that you know what we have to make some changes and um we all know people like this you know they they're narcissists or egoists or however you want to say and they don't want to hear the bad news you know they don't they they would rather they'd rather crash the ship on the rocks than try to turn it to use a nautical term <laughs> that's it. So you know that's that's always a, a so back to monetization. You know, a, a, a lot of companies are are that are in the music space. They they have concepts for monetization that include ad ad support and selling tickets, uh, thir- being a third party vendor to tickets and taking, you know, typically. You might get, you know, get a five percent uh, of a ticket sale if you pass it on to Ticketmaster. If you're lucky, it may only be two percent, you know, whatever. Um, and I find that that is troublesome uh, to rely on. First of all, to to rely on advertising at the outset of a company's um, 
uh, birth is, 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 is a tough one. You know, we all, you know, the, the comp, you, you, you have to build a, you've got to build a base of users before you can ever, I mean, a serious base of users before you can ever really make money in advertising. And now, you, now, of course, you know, when I'm on Instagram stories, every third or fourth story is a, is an ad, right? They, but they, you know, somebody at Instagram decided we're just going to, we're going to launch this thing, not worry about revenue um, from day one and just build an audience. So that, that's the kind of decision that, you know, gets made every day. Is this, are we just going to try to build an audience and worry about monetization on the road? Is the monetization going to be advertising? Is it going to be premium? Is it going to be some combination? All these, all these companies, the, the company that the, the apps you use every day, you know, have, have gone through this process uh, from you know, all the way back to Twitter. Twitter's, Twitter's actually, from what I understand, is, is messing around with the idea of a, you know, of a premium version of Twitter. That I'm not exactly sure what the features were, would be, but you know, that, that's an example where you, it's, you never stop, you never stop I, you know, trying to figure out what the best model is going, you know, from stages and stages of companies goes, companies go through stages. Now you have Clubhouse, okay? Clubhouse is the, the other bright, shiny object. That's, you know, the music industry and not just the music industry, but many others are, are gotten fixated on as a way of promoting. Clubhouse is to figure out how the hell are we gonna make money? You know, what? So it is hard at the very outset to, to know what your business model is gonna be. And that's why you must be able to, you must be able to pivot. You must be able to um, make changes. It doesn't even have to be a hard pivot, but it, it may have to be some adjustment that, uh, that works. And software, you know, music creation tools are really hot. Music creation tools are really hot. And the, the company I mentioned before, Audible Reality now has a, a um, plug-in for digital audio workstations. So anyone can make what I call a vibe or a audio filter exactly the way they want music to be heard. And um, this is big business now. Companies like Splice are, are, have recently put out, a, I think they said they've, they have sent, they've paid out over $60 million to creators last year. Um, so that's another part of the music business that's, you know, not, doesn't get well, any headlines, um, but it's getting a lot of, not, it's getting a lot of investment. Splice just took in another big investment and it's also getting, um, it's actually creating real revenues for creators that are not necessarily the standard recording artists by creators. I mean, producers and, and, uh, and, and uh, artists who are not, you know, they may not, they're, they're just bedroom, bedroom producers, you know, they create sounds, they create um, packs of sounds that they sell and, and they sell well. So the sound packs are what they're called actually. And, that, and then other producers buy the sound packs and drop them into their productions. So the way music is produced now is completely different than it was when I was making records. Where, when I, at, at that point in time, when you know the artist would show up at the studio with the the band or you know whoever else was going to be recording with them that day and and record tracks. Today, music is being pieced together. It's being flying all around in pieces. Uh, from these sound packs to just, uh, you know, basic riffs and tracks that one guy comes up with the track and another, another guy comes up with the bridge and then the third guy comes up with a, a, uh, 
an instrumental part. And, and, and so there, sometimes you'll see writers, it'll be like 10 writers on a song. Yeah. And that's, it's, it's, and they may have never even met some, that's, that's a whole other world. So uh, another area of growth for the music industry, and I say music industry in the broadest sense, the industry of music is not the record industry anymore. You know, the, the record industry has has had a great comeback, but the, you know the record industry is a piece of a bigger, uh, a much bigger um, solar system that includes the live music industry, the streaming industry, the music music creation tools, AR, VR, uh, and um, and now you know nfts and selling merch um merch on demand and now you know it used to be the only way you could get a uh, a band t-shirt was you you know go to the show well now you can order it online and it's all made on demand so there's no inventory yeah that's amazing and um so many different elements there what i really loved what you mentioned about the pivoting where one of my you know key coaches and mentors told me that don't fall in love with the idea, fall in love with business because what you think the idea is at the start, you may get lucky and it stays similar, but it likely has to change. Um, number one, because you know the market, right? What's coming back from the market, what's working, um, it might not be working or something like COVID happens or, or something happens, right? Where you'd be like, we have to change what we do because we can't do the same thing. And if you do the same thing over and over again, so eventually people copy right? And, and, you know, model and things like that. So you want to be constantly innovating as well um, in what we do. So, um, and that's why, you know, people, you know, like yourself are great in that, right? To, to break that paradigm of, hey guys, you know, we need to think about this differently. So I really love um, that part. Yes, COVID, COVID forced a lot of pivots. And uh, obviously with the live business, first and foremost, you know, they had to, you know, Artists had to, they would, the artists and, and managers and, and, you know, everyone had to figure out, well, okay, we can't physically go on the road. How are we going to, how do we get our message out? How do we get our music out? And so, as I mentioned, it started out being really like simple, like sit on the sofa. And, and then it be, just kept getting more and more um, uh, elaborate. And then some of these things now are really elaborate. They're very, very high production, high end productions. And it's funny because they attract such a huge audience. Uh, even uh, Roblox, for instance, are, uh, Roblox is a gaming platform for youth. Their, their audience is like eight to 18, where you can make your own game. It's huge. Uh, they they put they uh, they put uh, an artist on live, and the response was incredible. There there, there was an incredible monetization out of out of that. So that was that. I don't know if that would have happened if if, if we were in a regular environment. The artist would have been on tour somewhere, you know. Yeah. And so they they. Yeah, they had to go to a studio to shoot something, but they didn't have to go on the road. So it changes the assumptions. There's no longer the assumption that, um, you know, and, uh, to get a message out, you have to go out in a, on a tour of, you know, 30 cities and sleep in the buses and, or the early, the young bands, they sleep, you know, they, they don't even have beds. They just trade off driving and, station wagons and SUVs, right? That's 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 the classic way rock bands started anywhere from, from Nirvana to the Beatles, you know, it was like, they'd be up all night driving, somebody would take turns driving. So it's, a, it's different now, you can stay home and reach the world. Definitely, a lot of opportunities there. I love that. Um, so finally, I guess, what, what one piece of advice would you give um, to all the entrepreneurs watching and listening today? Uh, I, well, again, to, to, to be, uh, to be flexible, to be, uh, and to 
not take it for granted that what you've conceived of is, is a product, um, or I should say, is a business. It, it might be a product, but it might not be a business. And there's a difference. There's great concepts. There's, there, I've, I can't tell you, there's hundreds of people that have asked me to get involved with something where I would say to them, this is a, this is a, this is a great feature. This is a great feature. It's not a, it's not a product and therefore it's not a company. It's a feature for someone else. And sometimes features, you know, they get taken out. You know, they get, they will sometimes have a, a good exit, um, but it's usually more of an aqua hire. So if you're developing, uh, if you're developing software, if you're developing an app, think about, you know, is this a feature? Is this a product? Is, and is there a real business here before you start? Because if you know that it's only a really gonna, it's just a great feature that, you know, some company's gonna snap, snap, snap up. Well, one, they might be able to do it themselves. Um, and you might be just showing them the way. Uh, or, but if it's really just a great feature, then you should know that you're probably, you're probably not in this for the long term. You're just gonna try to flip it. And just, you know, accept that. Yeah, I love that. Great uh, advice there for everyone and, on how to look at it. So, um, yeah, we connected through our networks where I learned about your awesome journey, uh, which includes, you know, more than over 40 years of experience in the music interactive industries. That's massive. And, you know, you've worked with some of the biggest music and interactive brands, um, uh, you know, that we've mentioned and delivered awesome results, you know, to all of them. So, you know, you act as the bridge between music and technology industries, which is very needed, you know, in these technological times of <laughs> pivoting that of where we're focusing these days. And you're an awesome guy, and I'm sure you'll continue to help people, businesses, and artists succeed. So I'm very grateful that we connected, and I look forward to working in the future as well. Nick. Oh, that's nice of you to say. And I, you know, I do really enjoy. I don't. I couldn't be doing this after all this time if I didn't love it. You know, and I, I just, I love, I love the energy and passion that comes with uh early stage companies because there's a all hands on deck mentality uh where everyone's just pulling and trying to you know like just make it happen don't worry about it who's doing what just let's get it done right i love that let's get it done mentality and um so you know and i and so when i take on a client i mean i'm i'm in it for i don't do that many at a time. Uh, I typically will limit to three or four companies at a time because I want to be able to give the right amount of time and effort. Um, I also want them to make enough of a commitment. So once I get involved, I don't, you know, I want to know that, um, you know, they're not going to just decide in 60 days that, you know, it's Eh, maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. No, no. I'm, and I want to. I want to be part of the management team for that period of time, and it's worked out well. Yeah, I love that. <clears throat> really powerful there. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for your time today. Sorry about the spotlight. <laughs> That's all right. It's it's shining on you uh, at the end yeah, here. I got the sides. I got. I'm half and half right now, aren't I? <laughs> That's right. That's all good. Um, your light's shining at the end of this uh, amazing interview today. So, you know, thank you so much for your time today, Dick. I'm sure many people have greatly benefited from your valuable wisdom. So how can people find you and, and get in contact with you? Oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks for asking. So uh, my website is devadvisors.com, D-E-V, advisors, O-R-S.com. And, uh, or you can find me on uh, LinkedIn, uh, Dick Wingate spelled w-i-n-g-a-t-e and uh i'm on i'm on you know i think i'm, I'm d wingate on twitter and uh you know just you'll find me just just google me uh, there's a big wikipedia page you know you'll you'll learn it more than more than you want I love it. Yes, definitely. Um, amazing there. Definitely check out Dick. He's, um, you know, so much knowledge and, and help for people that are in this space. So um, thank you everyone for watching, listening to this show where we talk about everything on business growth. 
please like, subscribe, and leave us a five-star review. You can find me on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and YouTube as Ethan Cassiotis, or visit my website, ethancassiotis.com. I completely agree with you, or do I? The only way we know is if you tune in next time. So until next time, remember that our business grows when we learn skills and take action using them in spite of fear. Have a great day.